I'm going to bring in my panel. Join me right here in New York in the studio, no less. Katie Fang, attorney and the host of The Katie Fang Show here on MSNBC Weekends. And Hugo Lowell, political investigations reporter for The Guardian. You guys, it's so good to have you here. Good so let's you. get into this. Um, you were in Atlanta, Katie, right? Yes. You were there. You saw all these co-defendants go one by one into the Fulton County Jail, all 19 of them. Uh, next steps are what? Tell me what DA Fannie Willis wants to do and whether she's likely to get it done her way. So the next step is she wants to have the arraignments the week of September 5th, which mm -hmm. time's a ticking. That's going right. to come up in the next couple of weeks. In the meantime, we have a couple of major developments that you noted at the beginning of the segment. One, we do have a trial date set of October 23rd, which is just in two months, for Kenneth Chesbro. He demanded a speedy trial. Sidney Powell literally cut and pasted his actual <laughs> demand for a speedy trial. Didn't even change the gender from his to her. Her. Wait, seriously? Um, seriously. It was oh, come on. To, verbatim. But we don't have a trial date. There is the possibility that maybe she could get a trial date as quickly as the end of October as well by Judge McAfee. In the meantime, we have our eyes set on Monday. Very important hearing on Monday. Mark Meadows is the canary in the coal mine, as I like to say it. He's floating that test balloon as to whether or not he qualifies as a federal official to remove his case to federal court. I'd like to remind people that it's actually a two-step process. Can you get in the door to federal court? Can you stay in federal court? It's really actually a pretty low margin in terms of a standard to get into federal court. Whether he succeeds in getting his cases dismissed because of the supremacy clause, which gives him purported immunity for the actions he took when he was chief of staff, is left to be seen. Hmm. One last quick note, though. There's a second bucket of people that are trying to get to federal court, Alex. Those are the Georgia fake electors that have been charged in this scheme. There's three of them. They have a very novel concept to get into federal court. They're saying as a quote, um, what is the word that they used? Uh, contingent presidential elector. Okay. I was acting as a federal official, so I get to go to federal court. That is a completely novel theory, and it's going to be left to be seen as to whether or not it's successful. What are you hearing, Kenneth Chesbro, and and now I guess Sidney Powell, mm. uh, feminine though, puts it in, <laughs> in the masculine. I, I can't even believe she didn't, um, you know, cross that <laughs> T and dot that I. But having said that, does this give them the likelihood of a trial beginning early and then separating off from the rest of them? Because Fonnie Willis wanted all 19 to be tried together. How much does these little jigsaw pieces moving about the board, how much does that complicate things for her? I don't think it complicates anything for the district attorney. Huh. I mean, we had reported two weeks before the indictment that she was ready to go to trial as, as soon as anyone else wanted to go to trial. And I think if you look at what the district attorney's office was doing in the lead up to the charges coming down, was prepping for the pre-trial motions, potential appeals coming down. So they've already explored all these avenues. And if you look at the filings that the district attorney put in the Mark Meadows case for uh, removal, you know, she is already talking about the Hatch Act. She's already talking about why Mark Meadows doesn't have the ability to stay in federal court. I mean, she jumped the gun almost a little bit with some of her arguments, and I think that's kind of indicative of where the district attorney's office is at. And for Ken Chesbro to be saying, well, you know, we want to go to trial quickly because we're not sure if the DA was going to be ready, that was a gamble that doesn't seem to have paid off. And that's a point you're making, that it's, you said it's easier, the bar's low, to get into federal court, but staying there is a challenge. Why? Yeah, because you have to be able to show that the actions that you took when you were a federal official, that is, in the conduct that's being alleged in the indictment is clearly criminal in nature. And so mm -hmm. you have to be able to say that it was in, it was colorable defenses. It was colorable acts that were taken under your official kind of role as you were working as a federal official. Now, there is some case law in the 11th Circuit, which kind of controls what we're doing in Georgia, Alex, that says, you know what, you can get to federal court, but do you really have a plausible defense to stay in federal court? And so the judge could say, and, and, and I want to emphasize this, this is an evidentiary hearing. Mark Meadows may have taken a very bad gamble and risk by doing so. You have the burden, if you're Mark Meadows, to prove why you should be in federal court. So he actually has to present, he has to present evidence on Monday. Fonnie Willis has sent subpoenas to people like Brad Raffensperger. She's prepared to refute any evidence that he puts in his case. So we're looking at a mini trial of sorts on Monday in front of this federal judge. So then what, so what is Mark Meadows' strategy then? I mean, you're saying he's taking a huge gamble. What kind of a strategy, if you're advising him, what do you say that you think can work for him? I think that he's trying to show that, hey, I was acting under the blessings of a federal office. I am here and I should not be in state court to be prosecuted. I must be in federal court. Oh, and hey, by the way, you're never going to be able to really succeed when I'm in federal court because I have this immunity that I'm claiming under the supremacy clause. He's really kind of testing the waters. In some ways, too, the flip side, what does he have to lose? He gets kicked back to state court. Still has 
has his available defenses. He's still looking at the same charges. It's just he's trying to see whether or not he can actually get himself into federal court first. Okay, uh, Hugo, Monday you are going to be covering the Trump hearing, uh, but you're going to be inside the U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkan's D.C. courtroom, right? That's where you'll be on Monday. Uh, she's going to set the trial date for, for Trump's uh, case wildly differing opinions from prosecution and defense, really. I mean, it's like two years, two and a half years between start dates. When do you see a viable start date for that particular case? I guess it's January 2nd is what is being proposed of next year all the way to what, March, April of 2026. Where does this land? Does it come down before the election? I mean, I think the expectations were going to be before the election. Uh, and that's partly because the date proposed by Trump's lawyers was so out there that it's the kind of thing that a federal judge will look at and say, you know, this is ridiculous. I mean, they're proposing April 2026 for a potential trial date because they, they well, they got to this date because they were looking at what they call the median time it took for our other trials for the statutes that Trump is charged under to go from the start of indictment to sentencing. That is a period that is that includes the trial, the you know the jury selection, the the verdict, and then you mm -hmm. get sentencing. So they were already misleading about the date, and then they also represented the judge that there was so much discovery that they needed to get through, and they were making these comparisons about if you printed out all of the discovery, it'd be taller than the Washington Monument, and how you know it'd be like reading a Tolstoy novel, you know, several <laughs> hundred times, but. A lot of the material has already been in the public domain. A lot of the discovery material is Trump's own material. And, you know, I think one of the points that the government made, which was you know, kind of, um, it, <laughs> it explains itself because they were like, you know, you can use keyword search. You can do control F and find what you need. So, <laughs> They're trolling them. Right. They're trolling them. I, 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 honestly. And also, Donald Trump can make the argument, oh, we don't have the staffing for this. You can hire more people to go through all the discovery, right? There's nothing preventing him from doing that. Yeah, I mean, and absolutely. But, you know, I mean, look, Trump has his own issues there because it's, it's it has been a struggle for him to find lawyers who are willing to take him on as a client, willing to take this case. And, you know, that is part of the impediment. And I think the judge in, in the previous hearing was sympathetic to the Trump lawyers saying, look, we only have four people. You know, the, the, the government has, you know, 60 people on detail at the special counsel's office. That being said, a lot of the facts in this case have been public. Right. You know, we had the January 6th committee. Yep. It's not like they are seeing all this material for the first time. These are not novel, necessarily, kind of constitutional issues. And so if you factor all of that into play, you can probably put together a, 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 a good defense or a colorable defense probably in, like, you know, 15 to 20 months. So I, I was going to say, do you, do you have a guesstimate? Do you have an educated guesstimate of what you think when this will start? The way I look at this is I look at other cases where you have similar, let's say, mm -hmm. volumes of discovery. Yeah. There are cases with, you know, 60 to 100 million pages of discovery, and those go to trial in 15 months. So 29.2 months, that's a little excessive. Yeah. Okay. I think you're going to see a late spring, early summer trial date 2024.